les cuento un poquito sobre nuestro invitado de hoy. Él es profesor de la Universidad de Hebrea de Jerusalén, recibió su doctorado en física teórica en 1966 de la misma universidad, después dedicó dos años a estudios de postdoctorado en la Universidad de Stanford, en 1968 se unió a la facultad de la Universidad de Hebrea de Jerusalén, donde ha permanecido desde entonces. El profesor es director del Centro Einstein y la universidad lo nombró responsable de la propiedad intelectual de Albert Einstein. Dirige el Comité Ejecutivo de la Fundación de Ciencia de Israel y es el presidente de la Asociación Bashar, Comunidad Académica para la Sociedad de Israel. Durante los últimos 15 años, su principal actividad académica y administrativa en la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén, tanto en Israel como en el extranjero, ha sido la de preservar y promover el legado de Albert Einstein donde promueve la conciencia del significado de Einstein para la humanidad. Bienvenido, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I heard about your university, I heard about your great institute, and therefore I am more than pleased to have the opportunity to meet briefly some of the students, some of the researchers at this place. But I am particularly moved by the fact that I am talking in a hall that bears the name of Marcos Moschinsky. Now, Marcos Moschinsky, you all must have heard about him, I met him briefly once, but in 2005, when the world celebrated the 100th anniversary of the miraculous year, there was a public dialogue on Einstein and his achievements. Marcus Moschinsky was here. I was in Jerusalem. Because of the time difference, for me, it was two o'clock at night, and we had an unforgettable, at least for me, dialogue. And now being here in the Marcos Boschinsky Hall is a special treat. And I'm talking, going to talk about another 100th anniversary, the 100th anniversary of his general theory of relativity, and uh, I would like to add the second title. You see, this general theory of relativity, its final version was presented by Einstein to the Prussian Royal Academy of Science in Berlin on November 25th, 1915. But the general of relativity that we know today its formulation, the formulation of its principle is quite different from what was presented in the final version and what was summarized in this paper that appeared in the Annalen der Physik, the leading journal of physics in March 2016. It took several years to which we refer as the formative years of relativity, to revisit it, to reinterpret it, and even to modify and change some of the underlying principles which led, which led Einstein to his theory. Now, my talk is the history of that period, of those years. And it is based on work that but performed with a colleague of mine, Professor Jürgen Renn, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, and we wrote two books on this subject. One is The Road to Relativity, How Einstein Got There, and this will be the first part of my talk briefly, and then what happened afterwards in those formative years, and I'm happy just to tell you that the first one is already, has already appeared in your language. Now, why were we in a very unique and special position to be able 
to perform such a thorough historical investigation. And that the reason is that he's a great historian of science. I got into it in later years of my career, but I'm in Jerusalem. And the Hebrew of Jerusalem has one asset that no other university in the world has. We have the Albert Einstein archives. And the Albert Einstein archives is a collection of documents, photographic material, a vast correspondence between Einsteins and others, about 80,000 letters, many letters and, and manuscripts, many in his handwriting, that shed light on everything that Einstein stands for. And that is, first of all, for us, physics, but not only physics, because Einstein is a person who expressed his views on every issue that was on the agenda of mankind in those days. And all that is in those archives. So we had access. So let, let us now talk about, about the subject matter. So you see, if you have this man riding on a train, and the train is riding at constant velocity. Now, he does not miss the cup when he pours coffee. Doing this experiment cannot tell him if the train is at rest with respect to the platform or is moving, as long as it is moving with constant velocity. Einstein claimed that there is not only this simple experiment with coffee, with the but no experiment that you can do will tell you if your train is moving or not. This is the principle of relativity. This principle of relativity, together with the principle that the velocity of light is constant, independent of anything, this is the core of the special theory of relativity. Once he formulated his special theory of relativity, Einstein wrote, since the introduction of the activity, everybody who thinks about generalization must now ask what would be the general principle of relativity. Now, the general principle of relativity, what is the meaning of a general principle of relativity? That is not so simple. Because clearly, general means not only homogeneous constant velocity, but maybe accelerated velocity. Now, if you are in an accelerated train, you can easily tell, even by doing this, you will miss the cup. So that is simple. He knew that. So here gravitation comes in. And the general theory of relativity claims, the general principle of relativity claims that in a frame, when you move with acceleration, there will always be a gravitational field which produces the same effect. Namely, you see, uh, this uh, gentleman in the elevator is accelerated upwards. If he would not be accelerated upwards, but would be at rest in a gravitational field, there would be the same effect, and he has no way to tell if he is in an accelerated frame or not. So this, this equivalence between, between acceleration and gravity is the cornerstone of the next theory. Einstein referred to this insight as the happiest thought in his life. So, but, a, what causes this gravitational field? The gravitational field that should produce the same effect of acceleration is caused by masses. A mass produces gravitational field. So there was this physicist philosopher Ernst Mach who claimed that all the effects in an accelerated frame are caused by 
the distribution of mass in the universe. You see Einstein here riding on a train which is accelerated, rotating, cannot keep his head. Why? Because there is a centrifugal force, and we know that the centrifugal force is a fictitious force. It is because of the acceleration, it is called an inertial force. And Newton would say that this shows that there is some motion which is absolute with respect to absolute space. Max said no. If the train would be at rest, and all the mass in the universe would rotate, Einstein would still not be able to keep his head. This is Mach's principle, and, uh, and that means the following. You see, Newton said that if you rotate a bucket with water, the surface is concave. Mach said, that even if you don't rotate this bucket, but the bucket is at rest, but the rest of the mass in the universe would rotate, you would have the same effect. That would mean a rotating, that would mean that in a rotating hollow body in the center, if your new theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, that Einstein was looking for, was searching for, the equations of that theory would show you that if you have a hollow cylinder, like a hollow shell like that, in the middle you should have Coriolis force, centrifugal force, all the inertial forces. That is what Einstein intended, wanted to achieve. He believed that the theory, he believed Mach's principle, he did not accept Newton's absolute space, and that is what he was searching for. So we mean, in the sense, the main eh, test of that theory would be if the theory would produce this concept that rotation at rest. If you have a rotating system, you can assume that it is at rest, but everything in the world is rotating, then you have the same effect, and you cannot tell the difference. So then comes another thing. Immediately at that time, Einstein realized that if you introduce gravitation, then the space is not Euclidean anymore. And why is that? Because if that, if that disk is rotating, then an observer that sits in the center or outside of the disk, these little rods are shorter. This is the so-called contraction, the Lorentz contraction. If they are shorter and you measure the circumference, you need more rods more measuring rods. That means that the circumference is longer than the diameter, because nothing happens to the diameter, and if your circumference divided by diameter is larger than pi, then it is not Euclidean geometry. And this linear acceleration we saw implies gravitational field, rotation leads to non-Euclidean geometry. So now, the main idea of this new theory that Einstein is looking for is that you extend the special theory of relativity to, to, to spaces, times with non-Euclidean geometry, and in non-Euclidean geometry the, there is, I shall not use, by the way, I shall not use mathematical formalism, there will be two or three mathematical expressions in my whole talk. Those of you who had courses on relativity or things like that, this will be trivial. Others, listen to my words and don't give up. So, so, so there is this, this co connection of, of functions that describe the geometry of space and since 
this Euclidean, Euclidean, non-Euclidean form of space was implied by the acceleration. Acceleration is equivalent to gravity. Therefore, gravity has to be described in geometrical terms. And this is the main idea that this, this, this so-called tensor, all these functions, there are 10 such functions, there are functions of the coordinates of space and time, and uh, they describe the gravitational field, they also describe the geometry of space-time, which is the same. So this is this. So general relativity describes gravity in purely geometrical terms and in the neighborhood of masses which produce gravitational field, the space has to be somehow non-Euclidean. It is very difficult for us, it is impossible for us to imagine, to think about non-Euclidean or about curved space and time in more than two dimensions, and therefore we need math mathematics, but there are all kinds of such metaphors, and matter tells space-time how to curve, curve space-time tells matter, a field equation describing the gravitational field generated by matter, and so this is what we are looking for. You see, in passing, and in anticipation, what I will tell you later, if such masses produce curved space-time, and if these masses move around, or move violently, then the shape will move violently. And there is a very deep, important, not simple question, if such distortion pr produced at a certain place in the universe by the motion of masses, if that will then propagate outside in the form of a wave. I shall talk about this question. This question is the very relevant these days with all the excitement of discovery, detection of gravitational waves. So, so the goals of the general theory of relativity is to describe the geometrical structure of space-time under the influence of a given mass distribution, to describe the motion of bodies and dry trace in the resultant curved space-time such that the equations will be independent of the frame of reference. This was the Einstein believed that this is the important test of such a theory. It has to be what they called covariant. It has to be consistent with what we know in classical physics. Energy and momentum are conserved. Energy and momentum in the new theory will be described differently, but they have to be conserved. And, of course, there is nothing wrong with Newton's theory, as long as the fields are not too strong, the velocities are not too weak. After all, Newton's theory explains the solar system to go with great, great accuracy every detail, except for one minor detailed discrepancy. I shall mention that later. But, so that is what he was looking for, and he realized that he needs mathematics. Einstein did not know mathematics. Einstein, at the, in the early stages, even had some disrespect for mathematics. The mathematics that he used in his miraculous year in 1905 is simple high school mathematics. Nothing sophisticated. Here he realized that he cannot do without it. Because curved spaces, differential geometry, tensor calculus. So he had this friend, Grossman, who was his friend from earlier years. He wrote to him that you have got to help me. And they met in Zurich for three months. And in those three months, Einstein learned the mathematics of differential geometry uh, formed by Gauss and Riemann and Levi Civita and, uh, and Ricci and, and everything. And 
there is this little book which we have in our archives. In this book, there is no text. There are dozens of formulas, of pages, which Einstein learns at the end of this book. In the end of 1912, he has the theory. The theory is there. Uh, of course, he writes to his friend Zomerfeld what I told you before, but he has the theory. And he looks at it, and he makes one of the big errors. He made, Einstein made many errors, many mistakes, errors of misinterpretation, of long, and sometimes even errors in derivation and calculation. So he abandons this because he erroneously believes that it does not give the Newtonian limit in weak, in the limit of weak fields, and he publishes with Grossman a gravitational theory, a gravitational theory of curved space. He calls it, he's called an outline of a general theory of relativity. Historians of science refer to it as the Entwurf theory, a German word. Entwurf, he writes to, uh, to Elsa, his cousin, who became his second wife, but at that time, he had a passionate love affair with her, and they corresponded secretly, they exchanged secret letters between them. He was still married, but he writes to her that he now solved the problem and he has to rest. He worked so hard, otherwise he will be. But the equations were not covariant. And Einstein, from that moment, for three years, tried to convince himself and the whole physics community that physics does not allow general covariant theories, that you cannot have it. And he invented argument after argument. They all turned out to be wrong. Until in that November, to which I will refer as the drama, there were things that made him think again. And he publicly submits to the Prussian Academy of Science every week a paper. And every week one paper. And one paper corrects something from the previous week. In the first paper on November 4th, he abandons that theory. He goes back to something which is generally covariant. I'm not going to explain to you uh, what happened, but until then, he writes, there was a fatal prejudice. Now, for those who do know something about general relativity, who have that course, let me just tell you what was wrong. In the old paper, since those elements of the tensor, of the metric tensor, the G, the function of space and time, yeah, they are the gravitational potential. In classical physics, the gravitational potential, the, the, the gravitational force, or every force, is the derivative of the potential. So he took the derivatives of those Gs as the force elements. But a derivative is not a covariant, is not a tensor. You need what is called the Christoffel symbol, only for those who know the thing. And that was the correction. Replacing derivatives of G by Christoffel symbol, and then he had a fully covariant theory. All right. And then uh, the general theory, uh, but then it was not, uh, there was some still a coordinate restriction, and then he removed this restriction, and then he uh, calculated and let me tell you, uh, I will tell you in a minute what this perihelion motion of Mercury uh, is. And finally, November 25th, he has the full theory. And the, the perihelion motion, you see, uh, astronomers already in the middle of the 19th century knew that uh, actually all our planets revolving around the sun 
According to Newton's theory, the elliptic orbit is constant in space. They observed that it was not constant in space, that the axis rotates. And it rotates by, by about 5,600 seconds per century. Now, 5,557 seconds of those could be explained by Newtonian theory, the effect of other planets. 43 seconds remained unexplained for hundred, more than 100 years, and already in 1907, Einstein expected that the new theory will explain it naturally. And it did. So when he did that, ah, let me now show you, just I, I'm not showing using, using uh, mathematical formalism, but this is the equation of general relativity. The right hand side is the source, it's the energy, the mass distribution. The left hand side describes the gravitational field or the geometry of space time. But this, of course, is a shorthand. Because if you want to calculate, if you want to write a book on numerical or numerical relativity, then you have to take, and then this is the equation. Sorry, it looks complicated. And the, again, for those who can recognize that the uh, combinations in the, in the brackets are those Christoffel symbols, which I mentioned before, no wonder that such equations, as complicated as they are, for many, for, at the beginning, there was not a single exact solution. Until today, we do not have exact two-body solutions, unlike in, in, in uh, Newtonian physics, where the, the two-body problem can be solved analytically. Uh, so uh, these equations hold over the years. Everything that we find, all the cosmological models, gravitational uh, waves, everything is in this equation. But we keep discovering them. This equation is something, is a treasure of secrets. And we know that we did not find all the secrets yet. It may hold many more. So this is this equation. And he published, you see, we like to look at manuscripts. So I'm not going to tell you the most cherished manuscript that we have in our, in our archives is his handwritten version of the summary of the general theory of relativity, 46 pages. We refer to it as the Magna Carta of Physics. And on the last page of this manuscript, we have here the correct prediction of the bending of light, which was, uh, which was confirmed uh, three years later. And we also have the prediction or the, the result of the calculation about, which gives the 43 uh, seconds. And when Einstein saw this, he almost got a heart attack. He was so surprised, so pleased. You can imagine the excitement. So now we have this. But now the story begins. And those hundred years, historians of science divide the hundred years of relativity into four periods. And first is the period of formative years between uh, the beginning until the beginning of 30s. In those years, many physicists were drawn into this field. But with the success and growth of quantum mechanics, many of them left the field. And then came a period to which another historian, Jean Einstein, refers as low watermark period. This, and then there was World War II, hardly any activity in this field. After that comes the Renaissance. And I'll say a few words about the Renaissance. And today, what Kip Thorne refers to is the golden age of, 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 uh, of general 
relativity uh, where general relativity is is really one of the pillars of modern physics. In the earliest years, it was something very esoteric. When I was a student, I never had a course in general relativity because that was something strange, unique, not, not quite physics. I regret it now, but I made up for it. <laughs> so, so today I'm going to talk about these formative years and the theory as we know it today is first presented in Einstein's Meaning of Relativity. This is a little book based on his lectures in Princeton where he, uh, uh, this is the param uh, paradigmatic text of that period. And you see, for example, in the original version, a Riemann tensor is mentioned, but the word curvature is not mentioned. All the geometrization and the geometric interpretation of, of the theory of gravity, gravity came much later. It was not a prerequisite of the theory. And so these formative years, uh, the intellectual, I would say, to end it did not end with the formulation of the field equation and uh, as I said immediately after its creation general relativity became a hallmark of international cooperation in the world of science <coughs> at the time and that was very interesting at the time when the first world war was had a devastating effect throughout Europe there was a very intensive activity in physics, actually the formulation of the theory, in Germany and in neighboring countries as well. And Einstein himself made further fundamental contributions, and I'll say a little bit about what happened in those years. So, the f so what happened in those years? There is a scientific community that emerged around the new theory. Fundamental concepts underlying the theory were revisited, reinterpreted, and even abandoned. And I will show you examples. The first exact solutions were found and analyzed. New insights were gained. The physical, uh, the mathematical, between the mathematical formulation and the physical meaning. The confirmation of light bending, one of the predictions of the theory, when that was, when that was it is astronomical observation by Eddington confirmed this prediction of light bending. Einstein became a world icon, a world celebrity. Uh, so people compare his fame at that time to that of Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Elvis Presley put in one person. <laughs> that was that was the fact. And then, uh, and then the beginning of relativistic cosmology. And I will talk about that. Because that may be the main consequence uh, of, of the theory. Attempts were made to go beyond the theory of relativity, like the unified field theory. I will not talk about that. Gravitational waves were predicted. And I will put a question mark. What does it mean that they were predicted? And I will say something about that. Was it a legitimate prediction or I leave you with that. If I have time, I will explain what that effect was. It was an effect that was predicted already then and verified with great accuracy in, the, in this millennium, the beginning of this millennium. But so you see, uh, now uh, in Holland at that time was a great physicist, mathematician, astronomer, Willem de Sitter. And immediately after this formulation begins a very profound, bitter debate. Because the sitter tells Einstein, now your field, whatever the, uh, whatever the solutions of your gravitational field equations are, and that is your field, is not determined only by the equations 
because differential equations also have boundary conditions and the boundary conditions may not be covariant and what is how can you uh, assume that there is a mass distribution that also fixes the boundary condition there was a big debate Einstein argued found a certain solution I'm not going to tell you it's completely wrong it is ridiculous uh, the sitter immediately told him that your cure is worse than the disease and then Einstein had a brilliant idea and he published the first paper on cosmology cosmology I mean a, the realization that this equation can be applied to the universe as a whole as one entity came later was not mentioned in the strive to the theory and its first formulation and in that uh, in that uh, article uh, first of all he assumes that the consistent theory of relativity there can be no inertia relative to space max principle has to be and he realized that there is a problem with boundary conditions so he very cleverly suggested that the universe is closed and the closed universe does not have boundaries so you don't have boundary conditions and again he also uh, he also uh, had another belief which is based on his philosophical commitment and that is that the universe is static he and I will show you this is one of the biggest maybe mistakes tragedies of Einstein this Odyssey that Einstein refused to accept the idea of the expanding universe for more than for more than 10 years 15 years it was static and defended it the, the idea so but but the problem is that the static universe is not a solution of the gravitational field equations so in order to account for that he introduced what is known another term into this equation which is called the cosmological constant and this is the history of how the cosmological constant was introduced and removed by Einstein himself so so this is this is it. and then the sitter surprised him even more because the sitter showed Einstein that his equations have a solution of a universe without mass that means that there is still a metric tensor so the metric tensor defines inertia but no mass so where is Max principle it is not it's not that some uh, some uh, distribution can, uh, can determine uh, or determine this inertia and he said of course if there was only a single particle in the universe no stars no nothing then this particle would still feel those fictitious forces because this is the solution and this uh, Einstein immediately responded to that no that cannot be first so first he thought that there is a mistake like always this was always his first reaction then he thought better Einstein uh, I'm not going into all the details that were on that slide now uh, the debate between Einstein and the sitter there were two great physicists mathematicians Felix Klein and Hermann Weil joined that debate and over two years we have in the archives 34 how many uh, 34 yes 34 letters exchanged between Einstein and the three debating exactly that issue Einstein thought that there is a problem in the sitter's solution that there is a certain singularity there which he called this uh, there is a singularity and in that there is a singular uh, region in space-time and in that singular region all the mass is concentrated there so it is not quite free 
Now, why did it take so many letters to exchange, to discuss that? Because you see, in those days, the one of the biggest problems in the mathematical treatments of those equations was the nature of singularities. Such equations, there are many singularities. There are singular points. But certain singularities are not physical singularities. They have to do with the choice of coordinates. For example, if I ask you, what is the longitude of the point of the North Pole? One point on the globe. This is a singular point. If you describe the coordinates on the globe by longitudes and latitudes. It is not singular because nothing physical happens there, does not happen anywhere else. People did not know how to distinguish because, between those things. And finally, uh, I think it was Klein, he convinced, he convinced uh, uh, Einstein that there is no singularity in the Sitter solution, and Einstein said, uh, uh, okay, it's free of singularities. There actually is a singularity free solution, but then he said, uh, uh, he, he, then he said, under no condition could this world come into consideration as a physical possibility. He's very stubborn. He's very opinionated. We know about his attitude until the end of his life to the interpretation of quantum mechanics. This happened several times before. This happened in these debates time and again. And then he decided that uh, uh, then he, he decided this mass spring, everything that he did, the whole debate was to save his philosophical conviction that Max principle is the governing principle in, in the universe. So once he realized that there are such solutions, he changed his attitude. Mach is not a principle of the theory, but is a criterion for acceptable solutions. So now the next thing happens. You see, now here's another surprise. There is this astronomer from Russia, uh, Alexander Friedman, and he shows Einstein that even with the model with the, with the cosmological constant, there are solutions which are non-static, which are expanding. So what happens? So Einstein, and he publishes in the, it in the German press. So Einstein first writes a small note, he, this comments that was published, that Friedman's solution is wrong mathematically wrong. But then he realizes that he was wrong. The Friedman solution is correct. So what he does, he, he does a second response, and this is one uh, example why it is useful, important. It's not, you see, looking at manuscripts is a great pleasure. We are fetishists. So this, we like to touch what he touched. Yeah? But then it is not only pleasure. It is important, it is useful, because you see here, here so he writes here uh, that in my previous work I have criticized, uh, now I, I understand that his results are correct. But you see here, there is something, there is one sentence which he has in the, in the handwritten, which he erased. He did not say. But we know what this sentence is because it's written here. So, so it, is, it follows that the field equation inside the solution, okay, what is this sentence here? But the physical significance can hardly be ascribed to them. He is stubborn. There cannot be an expanding universe. It is even more clear when he meets another great pioneer of relativistic cosmology, and that is this, this uh, Belgian priest, George Lemaitre. And Lemaitre published, published a, an article which actually precedes Hubble. He already uh, computes this expansion of the universe. He talks about the expansion of the, uh, he talks about the expansion of the universe and 
Einstein, uh, Einstein uh, tells him your calculations are correct, but for physics is abominable. Why? Because he cannot give up. And then comes, and I will go through that quickly, then comes uh, these astronomical observations. Einstein did not care about astronomical observations. He didn't know about them. Einstein actually in those years, all his interest in cosmology was to save Max principle for the behavior of the universe. It came only later. When Einstein was in Pasadena in the in, in, in 30s, and then he realized, uh, he, then he couldn't, I mean, he couldn't hold to that position uh, anymore. And uh, he, he met Hubble, he met the sitter there, he met all the astronomers and the, and the cosmologists, and no choice, so he wrote to his friend, uh, Besso from Pasadena, it seems that the universe is expanding. When he came to Berlin, it took him four days to write a paper. Uh, uh, where, and, and, uh, and later he admitted that if Hubble's expansion had been discovered at the time of the creation of the general theory of relativity, the cosmological member would never have been introduced. And he drops the cosmological constant. Another big error because he drops it at the wrong time. He drops it at the wrong time because a few years later, astronomers, physicists, cosmologists were compelled to introduce back the cosmological constant when they realized that, true, the universe is expanding, but the velocity of expanding is not constant. And then you need some other term to drive it, to drive it faster than, than homogeneously. Then uh, this I will do very quickly. Uh, he met uh, um, in Pasadena. He met Willem de Sitter. They uh, they talked a lot. They decided to write a joint paper. They wrote a joint paper. The joint paper uh, that they wrote uh, was. Uh, it predicted a density, a density was a little higher, but nevertheless, the, uh, the Einstein, the sitter, the Einstein, the Einstein, the sitter model was the standard, most popular model accepted by all cosmologists until it had to be abandoned. Uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance of, of physics, uh, of, uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance of, of general relativity, uh, when, when this uh, accelerated expansion was discovered. So this is the story of Einstein's involvement with cosmology. Now the next story, which I shall do quickly, I time, my time is running, I will do, uh, and that is gravitational waves. I will not talk about attempts of unified field theory in those days about other things. But the story of gravitational waves, the origin of gravitational waves, is a very interesting story. And most people who talk about it, I don't know if it's important to know it, if it's, uh, if it's interesting to know it, but most people who deal with it did not know it until we presented the story with Jürgen, gave a colloquium in Stanford, I gave a colloquium in Caltech, the same months that the gravitational waves were detected. And uh, the story is, begins like that. There is no mention of the gravitational waves in the original formulation of the general theory of relativity. It's not mentioned. It's briefly in passing mentioned uh, at, at, at a lecture that Einstein gave uh, in Vienna, and Born asked him if, uh, if one can think about something, and he answered, yes, it will travel with the velocity of light, and that's it. Um, the person who raised in the formative years 
the first one to raise this question of gravitational waves was, was Karl Schwarzschild. Now Karl Schwarzschild, he wrote to Einstein, uh, to Einstein that was still uh, in, uh, in 1916, it is still World War I, he is in the German army, he is confined to the Eastern Front, so all the correspondence between Einstein and Schwarzschild is from is a military address, and he is on the Eastern Front, and he does monumental, monumental, makes a monumental contribution. He finds the first exact analytical solutions of the gravitational waves. He calculates this mercury perihelion motion analytically, not like Einstein who did it, uh, who had to do, to use some approximations. Uh, his solution, as we all know, is the cornerstone, is the beginning, the genesis of, uh, of the concept of the, the existence, the, the study of black holes. And he writes to Einstein, and unfortunately, there are in this story three letters which are lost. We don't have them. But from the replies, we know what was them. So he writes to Einstein a letter, uh, which is lost, where he raises the question of the existence of gravitational waves. But at the same time, he writes a letter to Sommerfeld, and that letter we have, and I am continuing to rummage around in Einstein's field equations. Today I am totally bewildered, setting up the plane gravitational wave according to Einstein. One obtains a differential equation, hence no wave motion but infinite speed propagation. No waves. Einstein checks the calculation and responds to Schwarzschild, thus there are no gravitational waves analogous. So Einstein agrees, there are no gravitational waves. And this is probably related to something which has to do that there is no gravitational dipole. And that's, that's a different story. But then Einstein uh, gets a letter from the sitter, which is also lost. But we know what is in that letter, we can guess, because that letter tells him, aha, now I know how to do it. The sitter suggests to him a certain metric which is more convenient to treat this problem, and immediately after that, he writes, your letter pleased me very much, inspired me tremendously, for I found that the gravitational equation to first approximation can be solved exactly. So what is there? Following that, Einstein, you see these equations are highly nonlinear. He linearized them. And the linear equation, once you made certain substitutions, looks like Maxwell's equation of electromagnetic fields, and he can solve them, and here's gravitational waves. And he writes the first paper on gravitational waves, an approximate, I mean, already in June, this is two, three months after, after the publication of his general theory of relativity. And that is what everybody refers to when, he, uh, when we say what we all refer to. Myself, I was interviewed on all the talk shows in Israel when gravitational waves were discovered based on these documents. We say, yes, he predicted it. But, but, uh, oh, so so the, he finds six modes of gravitation waves, three of them do not carry energy, the other do carry energy. He realizes that those who do not carry energy are not physical, they, they have something to do with the choice of coordinates, but that is all, these are all details. But what is very interesting, that in that paper is something which in passing has nothing to do with gravitational waves, maybe, but he says that if there are gravitational waves, then the electron, the mass of the electron orbiting the mass of the nucleus should produce not only electromagnetic radiation, but also gravitational radiation. And this is very small, but since the beginning of the universe, we should see that they lose energy. In order not to lose energy, we have to have some quantum theory of gravitation. So that is already there. But 
Then comes another surprise. There is another physicist, and this is the last one. No, not the last one. The one that I will mention, Nordstrom Gunnar, and he was a very active, very active uh, relativist in those days. Actually, he, before Einstein, formulated the first theory of relativistic theory of gravity, which Einstein believed was the only viable substitute, but then it turned out that it predicted a wrong perihelion motion in the wrong direction, and it was abandoned. But he looks at Einstein's paper, and he finds a mistake. And it is a grave mistake. And uh, reacting to that, Einstein publishes another paper, where he corrects that mistake, the important question of how gravitational fields propagate, was treated by me in my academy paper one and a half years ago. However, I have to return to that subject matter. Now, the big mistake was that, and it is, again, so strange, and we cannot explain why Einstein did not understand it immediately. Because he found that, uh, that even a, a radial distribution of mass that oscillates like that, or a dipole distribution like, of a mass that accelerates like that with radiate energy. This is completely wrong. Everybody who knows something about gravitation waves knows that only a quadrupole mode of mass oscillations radiates. In that paper, it's not true. Uh, in the first paper, here he corrects it. And here we have the formula. But Eddington, uh, very clever, does not believe that Einstein had resolved it. Because after all, Einstein, Einstein showed that you have gravitational waves only when you linearize those field equations. But they are highly nonlinear. How can you tell that something like that would survive? And therefore, Eddington said, no, it is not. Not true, and then he also would uh, discuss these unphysical waves and, uh, and uh, any speed. This is a nice, I, I bring it because this is a nice quotation that any uh, speed of propagation relevant to them is only the speed of thought. And this is the title of a delightful book on, by Kenefic on the history and origin of gravitational waves. But now, uh, uh, there's one slide which is missing. Uh, I want to uh, Einstein, after that paper, for 20 years, the debate continued. Einstein did not mention gravitational waves for 20 years. In that booklet, Meaning of Relativity, gravitational waves are not mentioned for 20 years. Then in 1936, he publishes a paper with a colleague, Nathan Rosen. The title is, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? And the categorical answer is no, they do not exist. And why do they reach that conclusion? Because they show that if they do not take the linearized version and try to formulate plain waves within the full nations, they cannot get it. There was a mistake in that paper. He submitted it to the physical review. The referee found the mistake, rejected the paper. Einstein was angry. He wrote to the editor of the physical review, when I send you a paper, it is for you to publish and not to send it to others to criticize. Uh, he never published again in the physical review. He then published the paper somewhere else and left the question open. And then it continued until the 50s, the beginning of the Renaissance. Einstein died in 1955. 1957 was a big conference devoted almost totally to the question of gravitational waves. And there, the existence of gravitational waves became a consensus. The detection is a different story. About that, We'll have to hear from, from the director of your institute here. He knows 
more about that than I do. He knows a lot about that. So, but let me just conclude. This is the final slide. Because I gave you a story, a history. Uh, it's, it's a very convoluted history. Einstein, the hero of that history, is, is a stubborn, co uh, committed, opinionated human being, persevering to the goal. Uh, only in 1954, he wrote to another physicist, Pirani, that we should not talk about Mach's principle anymore, and he admits that he himself was devoted to that idea. So you see, uh, general relativity did not fulfill some of the principles that guided him in the long process toward this theory. The general theory does not generalize the relativity principle. We do not have the relativity principle. It is not true that for every motion we can have a gravitational field that generates the same the same effects in that reference plane. It is not true. Uh, the theory does not confirm Mach's suggestion that may inertial effects can be explained by motion relative to distant matter. We show it in, in the Sitter solution. We also know it because later Einstein tried to perform these calculations with a rotating hollow sphere and what happens inside and the effect, there are effects. You can identify centrifugal forces there, but they are far, far too weak to explain the physics. So there is no rotation at rest. And finally, the metric field cannot be accounted by material sources alone. So the conclusion, and I must tell you, there is no general theory of relativity. We do not have a general theory of relativity, although we use the name. In the 1954, uh, another Bondi, a great relativist, wrote an essay about that. He said it's one of the great misnomers of physics, but it is too late to change it. So what, but what do we have? Einstein did find a magnificently successful theory of gravity. And therefore, my final, my conclusion is no GR, but RG. No general relativity, but relativistic gravity. Thank you. a very, very interesting talk. Uh, do, do we have uh, time for a couple of questions? <coughs> Only if they have time. Okay. <laughs> I have all the time. If they have time, I... <laughs> yeah. Who was the referee that rejected... Uh, Robertson. Who? Robertson. Ah, uh, the one Robertson Walker. Robertson Walker. The, the Robertson of Robertson Walker. He was very proud of that, but he didn't dare, dare ad to admit it as long as Einstein was alive, I think. <laughs> <laughs> One another quick question. Uh, there, I, I understand there were attempts to develop a um, covariant theory in Minkowski that all failed. Uh, no, like I don't... Uh, there were theory... There were several attempts to include First of all, it's, it's not clear exactly what you mean, because Inkovsky formalism is the underlying formalism in general relativity. Einstein initially thought that Minkowski formalism is not necessary. It may be elegant, but it is not for special relativity. You can do special relativity without that, without the Minkowski formulation. You don't need that. For general relativity, it's absolutely essential. and. What is very interesting, you know, I showed you the, the uh, I mentioned that it is interesting to, to look at, at, uh, at manuscripts. So if you see the first page of the manuscript of general relativity that he wrote, uh, there is a title there. Uh, he immediately uh, begins this. Then he erases it, shifts it to the bottom of the page because he wanted a few introductory remarks. To in, initially, he, 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 want, he thought he could do with them. And in those introductory remarks, he acknowledges Minkowski that without him, 
We can always say that he did not. Without him, he wouldn't have the theory. That's, that's one thing. I don't know if you refer, there were attempts to do gravity within the special theory of relativity. If you do that, you have to give up the equivalence principle. There were physicists who were willing to do that. Einstein, no, on the contrary, because the equivalence principle is the, is the gift from heaven that can lead you to, to this general theory. Yeah, but that's, what I mean. that's what you meant. Yes, there were. Yeah. Einstein himself, by the way, Einstein himself right. tried to do it at the beginning, spent maybe one, two years on that, and then he realized that it cannot be done. Yes, I, w I would like to hear your opinion about uh, what seems to be a kind of historic controversy about the final form of the field equations concerning uh, Hilbert. Hilbert yes, so now, the, uh, that is, uh, that's a story, that's another drama. Uh, you see, one may ask, why did Einstein in this November uh, publish one paper after another? Uh, every week. He could have waited a little time and have the complete thing in one, in one version and not to that. And the thing is that uh, at the same time, uh, David Hilbert, uh, the great mathematician from Ettingen, uh, from Gettingen, was working on, on the same equations. And uh, so there was a race. Who gets there first? Uh, Hilbert submitted his paper five days before uh, November. On November 20th, he submitted his paper. It was published later, but the submission was on November 20th. And he writes in his paper, he acknowledges the greatest contribution to physics by, by Einstein. But still, the, pap the published paper has the correct field equations. So he beat Einstein by five days. So there, were, there was a group of historians, Jürgen Rehm was, was among them and two others, uh, that they uh, really explored both the, the Hilbert archives and the archives of the, uh, of the, of the, of the journal where it was published, and they discovered that Einstein, uh, that Hilbert, corrected the Galley proofs. You know, when you published, the editor would send you the Galley proofs. He corrected the Galley proofs. That initially what was published was not Einstein's November 25th, but November 4th, which is not the quite final verb. was equivalent to what Einstein had. So this is, all these details, see, there are things, uh, I must tell you something, you know, there, there, is, a, uh, there is a debate. There are people um, like Stephen Weidmerk, yeah, who writes a lot about, uh, and he says we should uh, separate uh, general relativity from the history of general relativity. Uh, this is, after all, uh, what, does, uh, what is the contribution of what I told you about the gravitational waves to, to how they were detected and what? That is done. On the other hand, there is this Lee Smolin, who is another illustrious thinker, and he says, no, physics should not be taught without its history. I'll tell you where I stand. I taught, I'm a physicist by training. All my life for decades, I taught everything that Einstein did except for the general theory of relativity. Brown motion and special relativity, everything, my students at the Hebrew University. It is only when I retired, retired from the presidency of the university, not before, and got interested in the archives that I for the first time read the original papers by Einstein. This for me was an eye-opener. Because it is very different from how these things are presented in textbooks. 
the motivation, the, what he was looking for, what, what he, how he formulated it. And I am convinced that had I known when I was a teacher what I know today, my students would have greater fun in my lectures. Thank you. <laughs> ¿Alguien más tiene preguntas? ¿Una más? Uh, in your arcades, uh, do you have a, a letter or something about his contribution or his position about the atomic bomb? Uh, yes, it's a different topic, of course. Um, e equals mc squared is an underlying, is the, uh, is the formula which explains why when you split uranium you get a lot of energy. That is true. Um, but from there, uh, even to the reactor, not only to the bomb, it, is, it took thousands of many years of research work, the technology, Einstein was not involved in that at all. Uh, Einstein uh, did sign a letter to Roosevelt warning, German, uh, warning uh, the United States that the Germans are on that track and uh, he had this prestige. And, uh, but when then, when the United States finally launched the Manhattan Project, not only he was not invited to participate, but those who participated were not allowed to discuss it with Einstein. And you can imagine why. And that is why. Because one of his good friends was Diego Rivera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's enough. Alguien más? Ah, Antonio. What was the role anything uh, of the fierce Pauli paper about uh, uh, this uh, linear approximation to the general relativity, its quantization, and the discussion in particular of the gravitational waves? It, when, the, when the discussion of gravitational waves, the discussion of gravitational waves in those years the linear equation, particularly following this very clever, insightful remark of Eddington, did not continue. They faded away. They were, a, a, when it was resumed with the Einstein, uh, Einstein Rosen paper trying to do it in the context of the full theory, not the linearized theory, it took a new course. It continued very intensively with Leopold Infeld, who also did not believe that gravitational waves existed. It was completely detached. It was clear that you cannot learn anything, that you cannot learn anything from this linearized formulation. You see, Einstein should have known that. Because Einstein, in the context of this Entwurf theory, which I mentioned in 1913, he tried, in that theory, the theory which he abandoned, he tried to resolve this question of rotation at rest. He calculated in the context of that theory the field in the rotating hollow mass shell. And he got what he wanted in first approximation. Then he did it in the second approximation. And he also got what he wanted. But then, and that was one of the reasons that he abandoned it, then Besso indicated to him, look at it again. And then he realized that he made a serious mistake in derivation, that he does not get it in the second approximation. So he should have known that there is, uh, should have been 
a little more care, knowing that the first approximation may be very misleading. And it played no role in the discussions in, um, in the Chapel Hill Conference in 1957, the linearest approximation. Anything else? Creo que ya no hay preguntas. Well, thank you so much again. Gracias.